Reaper's Grave is about a league from Longwood. Its shape is quadrangular, but wider at the top than at the bottom. Its depth is about 12 feet. The coffin is placed upon two strong pieces of wood and isolated on all sides. We were not allowed to place over it either a stone or a modest inscription. The governor opposed this pious wish as if a tombstone or an inscription could have told the world more than they already know. Napoleon was in his grave. Hudson's task was over. Nothing more remained for him to do but to collect his effects. For that purpose, he came to Longwood, caused a statement thereof to be delivered to him, examined everything, searched everywhere, and even went so far as to open packets, which the emperor himself had sealed before his death. But all his trouble was in vain. He could not find the secret object of his researches. Resolved, however, not to desist, he became the more tenacious, ransacked the place over and over again, closely questioned everybody, and only consented at last to withdraw after his agents had made an inventory of the furniture, packed up the books, and not a corner remained unvisited or a rag unregistered. We were anxious to preserve some objects, of no intrinsic worth, but possessing an inestimable value in our eyes as having been used by the emperor. We begged, we entreated, we fixed no limits to our offers, but the more we insisted, the more harshly we were refused and finally could not obtain anything. By way of compensation, however, Hudson announced to us with infinite grace that we were to prepare for our departure and that we should sail in a government vessel and at the expense of government. But about to leave St. Helena, the moment had arrived to sum up our reckoning with our hosts. General Petran had an old affair to settle with Lowe and was preparing to do so, but the jailer entered into negotiation and the affair was arranged. This had the effect of rendering him more pliable and attentive. He took upon himself to choose a ship for us, to give us a captain that might be relied upon and a crew of good sailors, and had cast his eyes upon the camel store ship, a light and commodious transport uniting every advantage. We were endeavoring to guess the cause of these sudden kind dispositions of Hudson when we were informed that the wonderful vessel was one used in transporting the provisions required for the island. We made a representation to him, but he exclaimed against it, protesting that we had been deceived and ordering us to send our luggage on board. We did so, and supposing we were to embark the same night, we followed. But before we left the island, we went to see for the last time the spot where Napoleon reposed. We bathed it in our tears. We surrounded it with violets and pansies and bade him a Jew forever. We took with us a few branches of willow, which the soldiers had not the courage to refuse us and arrived at Jamestown. But there had not been time enough to embark everything. Many boxes were still on shore, and the departure was therefore postponed till the next day. Hudson was waiting for us with Lady Lowe. He arrived and invited us to dinner, and we accepted mirth and magnificence presided over the banquet. Lowe was almost amiable. It might have been thought that he had resigned his keys, but we were totally undeceived in that respect when we got on board the ship, which turned out to be exactly as we had been told, a dirty, narrow vessel used for the transport of bullocks, pigs, sheep, for the consumption of the island. The connection was ingenuous and the choice worthy the person who had made it but we were going to escape from bolts and locks and we therefore resigned ourselves to the annoyance of being crowded pell-mell in a filthy ship the weather was fine not a cloud was to be seen we weighed anchor on the 27th of may and left this unfortunate station not however without regret the wind filled our sails, the day was declining, and St. Helena was disappearing in the horizon. We waved a last farewell to that horrible rock and went each of us in search of a little space in which we might repose ourselves. This was not an easy matter, for the deck was covered with boxes from the stern to the head. Nothing was to be seen but furniture and bales, and Hudson had, in addition, crammed into this frail boat, which was 
below the dimensions of a sloop, 200 soldiers whom he was sending to Europe. The only resource was therefore to squat down at the foot of a mast or upon the frame of a gun, in short, wherever a place could be found to lean one's head. We had passed the tropic and reached the equator. And the beauty, brilliancy, and mildness of the weather made us feel our uncomfortable situation less keenly. But we were, however, not long before we began to experience the effects of it. Abdominal pain soon made their appearance. Diarrhea followed, and we were threatened with all the ravages of dysentery. We redoubled our cares and precautions. We used medicines and salt water baths and succeeded in arresting the progress of the disorder, having only lost... A few soldiers. We had escaped disease, but our voyage had been so protracted that our fowls had perished. We had no more fresh meat and water and provisions were nearly exhausted when we saw the Azores. This was the first station we approached and sinking under the heat and fatigue. We requested the captain to lay to and send to purchase some provisions for us, but he had been ordered not to touch anywhere. We were only 10 days sail from Portsmouth, and he therefore refused. Madame Bertrand, being still an invalid, and recovering but very slowly from the illness she had suffered on board, we insisted, but we were told that there still remained some salt meat and a little water, that we could wait, and that he would make all sail and increase our speed. Our speed was indeed increased with vengeance, for the sky became dark, the wind impetuous, and the sea, violently agitated by the storm, carried us on at a rate of 9, 11, and 12 knots an hour. This storm proved fatal to us, for the sea covered two boxes where we cultivated the willow branches we had gathered on the emperor's tomb and killed them. Having passed Africa and being in Europe within the limits prescribed by Napoleon, his executors took cognizance of his last testamentary dispositions. They were intended to dwell only in the hearts of those whom they concerned, but England, where everything is turned to account, has rendered them public for a shilling. They, having therefore been published, I may without impropriety give them a place in these pages. Testament of Napoleon. This 15th of April, 1821, at Longwood, Island of St. Helena. This is my testament or act of my last will. One, I die in the apostolical Roman religion in the bosom of which I was born more than 50 years since. Two, it is my wishes that my ashes may repose on the banks of the Seine in the midst of the French people, whom I have loved so well. Three, I have always had reason to be pleased with my dearest wife, Maria Louisa. I retain for her, to my last moment, the most tender sentiments. I beseech her to watch in order to preserve my son from the snares which yet environ his infancy. For I recommend to my son never to forget that he was born a French prince and never to allow himself to become an instrument in the hands of the triumvirs who oppress the nations of Europe. He ought never to fight against France or to injure her in any manner. He ought to adopt my motto, everything for the French people. Fifth, I die prematurely, assassinated by the English oligarchy and its blanks. The English nation will not be slow in avenging me. Six, the two unfortunate results of the invasions of France when she had still so many resources are to be attributed to the treason of Marmont, Augereau, Talleyrand, and Lafayette. I forgive them. May the posterity of France forgive them as I do. Seven. I thank my good and most excellent mother, the cardinal, my brothers, Joseph, Lucy, Jerome, Pauline, Caroline, Julie, Hortense, Catherine, Eugène, for the interest they have continued to feel for me. I pardon Louis for the libel he published in 1820. It is replete with false assertions and falsified documents. 8. I disavow the manuscript of St. Helena and other works under the title of Maxim sayings which persons have been pleased to publish for the last six years. Such are not the rules which have guided my life. I caused the doc Duke Donguian to be arrested and tried because that step was essential to the safety, interest, and honor of the French people. 
when the Count d'Artois was ma- maintaining, by his own confession, 60 assassins in Paris under similar circumstances, I should act in the same way. Two, one, I bequeathed to my son the boxes, orders, and other articles, such as my plate, field, bed, saddles, spurs, chapel, plate, books, linen, which I have been accustomed to wear, and... Use, according to the list annexed, it is my wish that this slight bequest may be dear to him as coming from a father of whom the whole world will remind him. 2. I bequeath to Lady Holland the antique cameo which Pope Pius VI gave to me at Tolentino. 3. I bequeath to Count Montalon two millions of francs as a proof of my satisfaction for the filial attentions he has paid me during six years and as an indemnity for the losses his residence at St. Helena has occasioned him. 4. I bequeath to Count Bertrand 500,000 francs. 5. I bequeath to Marchand my first valet de chambre 400,000 francs. The services he has rendered me are those of a friend. It is my wish that he should marry the widow, sister, or daughter of an officer of my old guard. 6. To Saint-Denis 100,000 francs. 7. To Novaraz, 100,000 francs. Eight to Pierron, 100,000 francs. Nine to Archambault, 50,000 francs. Ten to Curso, 25,000 francs. Eleven to Chandelier, 25,000 francs. Twelve to the Abbey Vignali, 100,000 francs. It is my wish that he should build his house near the Ponte Novo de Rostino. Thirteen to Count Las Casas, 100,000 francs. Fourteen to Count Lavalette, 100,000 francs. Fifteen to Larry, surgeon in chief, 100,000 francs. He is the most virtuous man I have known. Sixteenth. To General Breyer, 100,000 francs. 17. To General Lefebvre Desnouet, 100,000 francs. 18. To General Drouel, 100,000 francs. 19. To General Cambron, 100,000 francs. 20. To the children of General Mouton d'Evernay, 100,000 francs. 21. To the children of the brave Le Bedoyer, 100,000 francs. 22. To the children of General Girard, killed at Ligny, 100,000 francs. 23. To the children of General Chartrand, 100,000 francs. 24. To the children of the virtuous General Travaux, 100,000 francs. 25. General Lallemand, the elder, 100,000 francs. 26. To Count Royal, 100,000 francs. 27. To Costa de Bastelica in Corsica, 100,000 francs. 28. To General Clausel, 100,000 francs. 29. To Baron de Menneval, 100,000 francs. 30. To Arnaud, the author of Marius, 100,000 francs. 31. To Cardinal Marbeau, 100,000 francs. I recommend him to continue to write in defense of the glory of the French armies and to confound their calumniators and apostates. 32nd. To Baron Bignon, 100,000 francs. I recommend him to write the history of French diplomacy from 1792 to 1815. 33. To Pogi de Talavo, 100,000 francs. 34. Two, Surgeon Emery, 100,000 francs. 35, these sums will be raised from the six millions which I deposited on leaving Paris in 1815 and from the interest at the rate of 5%. Since July 1815, the account thereof will be settled with the banker, the Counts Montslaud and Merchan and Bertrand, 36, whatever that deposit may produce beyond the sum of 5,600,000 francs, which have been above disposed of, shall be distributed as a gratuity amongst the wounded at the Battle of Waterloo and amongst the officers and soldiers of the battalion of the Isle of Elba, according to a scale to be determined upon by Montsalain, Bertrand, Giraud, Cambron, and the surgeon Larry. 37, these legacies in case of death shall be paid to the widows and children and in default to such shall revert to the bulk of my property three my private domain being my property of which i am not aware that any french law has deprived me on account of it being required from the baron de la bouillerie the treasurer thereof it ought to amount to more than 200 millions of francs namely i the portfolio containing the savings which i made during 14 years out of my civil list which savings amounted to more than 12 millions per annum if my memory be good to the produce of this portfolio three the furniture my palace is such as it was in 1814 
including the palaces of Rome, Florence, and Turin. All this furniture was purchased with monies accruing from the civil list. Four, the proceeds of my houses in the kingdom of Italy, such as money, plate, jewels, furniture, equipages, the accounts of which will be rendered by Prince Eugène and the steward of the crown, Cambagnoni. Two, I bequeath my private domain, one half of the surviving officers and soldiers of the French army who have fought since 1792 to 1815 for the glory and the independence of the nation, the distribution to be made in proportion, proportion to their appointments upon active service in one half of the towns and districts of Alsace, Lorraine, French Comte, Burgundy, the Ile de France, Champagne first. Dauphiny, which may have suffered by either of the invasions, there shall be previously set apart from this sum, one million for the town of Brienne, and one million for that of Mary. I appoint Counts Montalain and Bertrand and Marchand, the executors of my will. This present will, wholly written with my own hand, is signed and sealed with my own arms. Napoleon.